Shalom of Rocha, Habrucha Ma'aboyim, and welcome to this fantastic program of Chizik. I want to thank personally Yedidi Hanemon, the unparalleled Rabbi Simcha Scholar Shlita, for inviting me to share with you some Derei Chizik and Derei Hesora, some words of inspiration. I have a very special yachas, a wonderful, warm relationship with Rabbi Scholar. I call it all to him what he's done, High Lifeline, this incredible and truly special organization. Hashem should give him kochas atzumos and make life easy for him so he can continue his tremendous avodah sakodesh together with High Lifeline, inspiring and assisting so many countless individuals and families and helping bring about Mashiach Tzedkenu and Meira Yamenu. I want to thank as well Dr. David Fox for joining Allowing me to join with him, it's a tremendous chus, a wonderful COVID, to speak alongside the renowned, illustrious Dr. David Fox. And I want to thank each and every one of you personally for making the time so that together we could share some words of inspiration, some words of encouragement under the general topic, as Dr. Fox has outlined, uh, going through it and growing through it. So we're right on the heels of Chaga Pesach and the Yantif of Pesach. As of Hunter Zatzal, I used to say, we never leave a Yontif behind us. We don't simply journey through one of the Jewish festivals, and then it's behind us, and then we go fight there, then we march onward. Chalil Vachas, God forbid. We pass through a Yontif, we have to take the Yontif with us. We have to be collate, we have to absorb all the Nitzotos, all the Hashpa, all that, every respective Yontif, all the Chagim, all the Moadei Yisrael, that they have to offer us. Hein Beruchrius, Hein Begashmius, we take it with us. And we absorb it, we ingrain it, we inculcate it into our minds and imbue it into our hearts. We carry it with us forward and we allow ourselves to be inspired, to be uplifted, to be indeed truly elevated by all that every single Yontif has to offer. So we're not too far beyond the Yontif of Pesach. We just concluded the month of Nisan. So let me take you back to the outset of Parsha's boat. And together we'll read the Posik Paragud, Posik base right at the beginning of the Parsha. And we're holding now by the introduction to plague number eight, to Marcus Arba, to the plague of locusts. And in his prefatory remarks, Hashem Yisbrach says to Moshe Rabbeinu that one of the reasons why I'm continuing with the Makis and really one of the general primary chief objectives out of all of what Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim, all what the Exodus encompassed, was Ulamat Sapir Biazni Bin Choben Mincha, Esa Shere Salalti Bin Mitzrayim, Eso Sasaya Shere Sapti Vom Vidatem Keani Hashem. Hashem Yisbrach, the Almighty, is turning to his devoted, loyal servant to Moshe Rabbeinu. And he says, my dear Moshe, I want you to convey to Klai Yisrael. I want you to take the messages. I want you to be Mekayim to fulfill the Gadotel of Vincha. And it doesn't stop at simply relating and recounting the story to your children, to your direct descendants. I want you, Lamont, to stop there. Seep or connoting and conveying the sense of elaboration, of expelling upon all these events. The significant to the most picayune. Lamont, to stop there. Give it over, but not just to your own children. Give it over to your grandchildren. Perpetuate this message of Yetzias Mitzrayim, of God's omniscience, of God's omnipresence. I want you to transmit it to the next generation and then to the generation beyond that. And what's the talkless? What's the objective? Why? Why do you have to carry it over? Why do you have to transmit and talk about it? Concludes the posseg, the verse... And then says, we adopt him so that you will know that I am Hashem, your God. I'm the Almighty above. Asks from Chatzka Lebramsky. And the Sefer Chos in Yecheskel on Tanakh, Rav Chatzka Lebramsky, I pose the following interesting deal, the following question. He says, God is speaking to Moshe. So the terminology ought to have been, V'yidu, you're going to transmit the story, convey all the messages, the concatenation of all that you'd see us with Shrayim, the Exodus entailed. I want you to give over the details and the plagues and the story, everything that unfolded before your own eyes and why you're going to give it over and speak it over to the next generation. The terminology should have been v'yedu dahainu v'heim yedu ki ane Hashem so that the next, the ensuing generations, your offspring and your scions, your continuing descendants, they should know that I am God. But that wasn't the terminology. 
The terminology, fascinatingly enough, was viadatem. You should know. Say, what do you mean you should know? Of course I know. God is speaking to Moshe Rabbeinu, the Avon Avim, the Godahan Avim. Through him, through this messenger, he is the conduit. He's saying this is a message for all of the door, this generation of Yotzim and Tzrayim. What do they have to see and speak it over? Why speak it over? They were there. They witnessed it firsthand. It's only the children and the grandchildren who weren't there, who didn't witness it firsthand. They have to be told the story so that they can know that God above is the only God. But via Datem, you should know second person. Of course they know. They saw it. So why did the Torah write via Datem? Explains Rabbi Yecheskel Abramsky. Because it's very nice to believe that God is the one above, is the only one above, is the Echad Yochad Miyuchad. But you know what? It's not enough. Because to really believe, you have to speak it out. It's one thing to believe something in your heart of hearts. But when you speak it out, it comes into the world of reality. As the Maramik Prague explains, when it comes to the tshuva process, someone is undergoing the thorough, exhaustive process of repentance. Vidoy plays such a prominent role, occupying center stage, especially in accordance with the opinion of the Rama of Maimonides, that when you're doing tshuva, it's first and foremost about vidoy. What's vidoy? Confession. Confessing verbally before the Almighty above. Asks the Maral. God knows what I'm thinking. The Pasuk says in Yemiya, Perkid Zion, God is choker leif. Obachin Klaius, he can delve into my mind. He knows my innermost thoughts and emotions. He knows what's going on in the inner recesses of my heart, the chambers of my soul. Why do I need to speak it out? Explains the famed to mystic, the Marami Prague, because you need to come face to face with your thoughts and emotions. And when you speak something out, you manifest it from the world of potential to the world of reality, the world of the abstract to the world of the concrete. You bring it down to this world. You can now articulate those words. You can speak out that message. And now you face it. You see the words. It's far more tangible. In a sense, yes, you know what you're thinking. You know what goes on inside your heart, inside your mind. You know what's lying dormant, dormant in your soul. But you got to speak it out, as the Maral explains in chapter 28. Uh, Hashem, every time you open up your mouth, you let the world know what is the real you through your pet osios po you let the world know who's the real you when you speak something out through the conduit through the vehicle of the lips the lips of the skin on the inside turned outwards because every time you move you move, you move your lips what are you doing in a sense you're letting us know what makes you tick. Who's the real you? It's very nice. You might be thinking certain things. And you can have various emotions, diverse emotions, banding about your soul. But you got to convey it when you speak it out. Lamosho, for example, in the tshuva process, you can know you did a sin, you perpetrated a wrongdoing. I but when you speak it out, you articulate it, you enunciate it, you brought it from the world of the abstract into the world of reality. Now it's part of reality. And that's what we have to do. We have to make it tangible. It's something real. So you got to speak it out. It's very nice to believe in your heart of hearts, but Amuna mandates you got to speak it out. Why? Explains a Chatz because that will reinforce, that will strengthen. What is Amuna? Amuna, Amuna is I believe in God, but if you really believe it, then you'll talk it out, then you'll speak it out, and that demonstrates bringing it from the world to the abstract to the world of the concrete. It's a famous story told of Dr. Spock. Dr. Spock, as you know, he wrote so many books on child on raising children. And there was one time that he was pouring a fresh cement into his driveway. And a bunch of youngsters, the young kids, they were running around. And they saw, ah, you tell young children, we got some wet cement over here, poured into the driveway. And quickly, a whole group of young children, they came and they quickly stepped to put their footprints into that freshly laid cement. And they started running as fast as they could. And Dr. Spock saw what they did and he comes out of his house. And he's running after them and he's and he's screaming at them. And he says, you boys get here. I'm going to teach you a lesson. And Mrs. Spock is witnessing the whole scene unfold before her very own eyes right through the kitchen window. And she yells out, excuse me, my dear husband, Dr. Spock. Aren't you the one who talks about not screaming at young children, about loving children unconditionally no matter what they do? I thought you were supposed to love children. He says, of course I love children. I love them in the world of the abstract, but not in my concrete. And then I love them so much. Kaya, so you can believe in God, but don't let it stay. Isolated, quarantined, sequestered in the world of the abstract. To make it a reality. You got to speak it out. And the more you speak something out, the more it becomes a reality. 
the more you can come face to face with who is the real you. What are your innermost thoughts and emotions every time you speak it out? And with that in mind, let's turn to another famous Rabbi Yecheskel. This time it's the Panovitcher Mashkiach Rav Chatzkel Levenstein. And the Sefer, Otsros, Rabbi Yecheskel in the category of Amunah B'Tzachin. Rav Don Segel, I mentioned in the name of Rav Chatzka Lebramsky the following interpretation of a posik in Yirmiya, the Navi, Navi Yirmiya Prakzayin Posuch of Ches. And there the Navi who is describing ah, the door of the Khurban, all the lamentations that were watching the utter destruction, uh, how Klaius saw the Jewish people sinking uh, to these low levels of corruption, of immorality, of depravity. And Yirmiya says they lost their Amuna of the Amuna of Nechris Sami PM and Zion Chav Ches of Sefer Yirmiya. And he's lamenting the fact that Kais or the Jewish people, they lost their amuna and they stopped speaking about it, seemingly. At least at first glance, one would interpret the verse that they lost their amuna, and they stopped speaking about amuna. They weren't speaking about God any longer. Explains a Chatzko Levinstein. No, the way to reread the Pasuk, reread the verse is of the Amunah. You know, the reason why they lost their Amunah, precisely because of the Nechrosami PM. They stopped speaking about it. And when you stop speaking about something, then you lose that connection to it. You have to speak it out. It's very nice to believe something in your heart of hearts. But if you don't speak about Amunah, you don't speak about God, you're not communicating regularly, actively with HaKadosh with the Almighty above, then slowly but surely, what tends to transpire? You start losing that connection. You start severing that strong bond with the Almighty above. That's the idea of Chatzko. Uh, Levenstein explains when we turn to Tehillim. And Kapitol Kuv Tassayin Aposek Yud. And the book of Psalms in 116 verse 10. And we say it in the Hallel Sholem. We said it at the beginning of the Yant of a Pesach. Hemati ki adaber. Ani anisi maot. Hemati ki adaber. I believe in God and I will speak. I will speak what? Explains to Chatzka Levenstein. Hamanti, you know why I was filled with Amuna? You know why I believed? Because Ki Adaber. Hamanti, Ki Adaber. That's the reason. Because I wouldn't stop talking about it. I was talking about God all the time. I was talking about Amuna. I was talking about Bitochen. That's the message that David and Melech wanted to convey. In Psalm 116 and verse 10, I never allowed my Amuna to diminish one iota. And what's the reason? Because Ki Adaber, because David was a walking, breathing. I know him as a he was a walking as he described earlier in Psalm 109 in verse 4. Vanit Tfila, I'm a walking Tfila. David Melech was a living, breathing, walking Tfila. He was a walking prayer. His lips never stopped moving. He never stopped talking and describing and articulating what Amunah B'Tachon were living with the Almighty above 24-7, 365 is indeed all about. And perhaps on the heels of that, we can approach a fascinating question that many commentaries grapple with. And that is that already when the Jews were in Mitzrayim in the land of Egypt, the Torah shared with us that the Jews believed. And then we fast forward to Shira Sayyab. We move on to the fourth Torah reading in the book of Exodus and Sefer Shemos. And we make our way to the middle of Parshish Mashalach, Az Yosher Moshe. And we're breaking out in song Shira Sayyab as we miraculously crossed over the sea. And what do we read in that context? Now the Jewish people believed. And the question, of course, that beckons our scrutiny. Year after year, when we encounter this verses, what do you mean? A Torah, Kedosha, the holy sacred words of the Torah. You already told us that the Jews believed. Didn't Mitzrayim in the land of Egypt before they even had the Exodus? The Torah already shared with us. They already believed. So what's this new idea of a Yamino Bashem? So perhaps in my humble opinion, the idea is this very concept that we've seen from the two Rabbi Cheskel, so Chatzka Labramski, Lamanta Saper, Chatzka Levenstein, Hamanta Kiyadaber, of the Amuna Kinechur Sabepi, and we got to speak things out. You're right, the Jews believed. We witnessed the Marcus. We saw Dam, Tzvardeya, Kina, Moreb. We saw those varied plagues, and we saw the miracles that accompany us as God saved us and took us away from the servitude and the abject, oppressive, slave-like conditions in the land of Egypt. 
Egypt. But then what? But we didn't sing that night, at least according to many men Roshib. And according to the overt psukim, the verses in the Torah itself, we got out and it was in our heart of hearts. But when we got to the Yamsuf, and then we broke out in Shira, we broke out in song, unbridled, unfettered, unrestrained love, and we spoke it out and it's time to speak it out. But we joined with Moshe Rabbeinu and the euphony, the harmony that ensued was in synchronicity. The Jewish people together as one. Vayaminu Hashem when in the context of singing it out, of speaking it out, because when you speak it out and when you sing it, ah, that's the shlemus of your koach hadibor. That's when you let all your insights pour out as the moon Rebbe, the Mincha Saloza writes in the Sefer Devrei Torah, a song in Hebrew is called the Shir. What's a shir? Shir is milosh and shirayim. It's a leftovers. If you ever go to Hasidic Shatish, the Rebbe's very often, they hand out leftovers. Explains the Mincha Salazar, the Hasefer Debre Torah, the Munkach Rebbe. You know what a shir is? The shirayim of the soul. It's the leftovers of the soul. There's so much you want to say and it's swelling, boiling up inside you. And you want to convey it. You want to manifest it. Get in me koch lepoel. You want to bring it to the world of reality from the abstract to the concrete. When you sing it and you just let go, you can't can't control it, you can't harness it, contain it any longer, and it's the shirayim which just bursts forth from the soul, and then you know you really believe, it's very nice to believe it in the heart of hearts, but when you speak something out, then you're entering a whole different dimension. Now you brought your innermost thoughts and emotions to the world of the Metzius Samitis, the world of reality, Mikoach Lepoel, from the inside to the outside, from the world where it was latent, merely lying dormant, and now you manifested it, you exhibited it, and you brought it to the world of actualization, of materialization. You could confront it, you could deal with it, just like confessing your sins when you confess it then you've come to a greater a cognizance, a greater awareness and a recognition of what your sins are, who you really are. So to Shira Sayab, we took the Amen Ha'am, and now we brought it to a whole loftier plateau, to a much greater elevated level. And that is that now that we said it and we sing it, ah, now it's a whole different level of Amuna. Perhaps that's one idea. When we turn to the end of Masech Hasmachis, and the Gemara says that all 613 mitzvahs come down to one yesod, one basic foundation. And that is that Bo Chavakuk, the Novi Chavakuk, and the Treyas are in the 12 prophets. We have the Novi Chavakuk who tells us, and Perak Beis and Pasik Dalin in chapter 2 and verse 4, that Sadik Bamanoso Yichia, it all comes down to Muna the same way. Pesach begins the year, that's the time God took us out of Mitzrayim, the first in the Decalogue in the Aser Sedibris. Anochi Hashem Wai, because God took us out of Mitzrayim. The Yesod of Amruna Bashem, because God took us out of Mitzrayim. Try it. That is a Muna. And a tzaddik lives with a Muna, but as the Ben Yoda makes the diok, tzaddik be'amuna, so yich a tzaddik, a righteous individual, lives be'amuna, in a Muna, tzaddik, the terminology ought to have been, a tzaddik lives in a Muna, so yich a not be'amuna, so, so perhaps again we could suggest, what's the base of Munos? The Ben Yoda. Avi Ben Ishchai says it's an Amuna B'Seichel, intellectual belief. And then there's Amuna B'Chosh that you believe it in your hearts, you can sense it. But perhaps if we build on the Ben Yoda, what are the Beis Amunos? The Beis Amunos are what Amuna is. It's in my heart. I feel it. I, but you got to speak it out. It's a whole different targa, a whole different level. When you can believe something in your hearts, but then you can speak it and bring it to the world of reality and manifest it and bring it to the outside world. It's a whole different, far more tangible, far more real authentic and genuine sense of Amuna. Atzadik lives with Beis Amunos. He doesn't keep it in his heart of hearts. He always speaks it out. He always articulates it. Atzadik lives with Beis Amunos. Hence, as the Ben Yoda points out, Atzadik is Gematria. You add up the respective letters and it yields the Hebrew numerical equivalent. Tzadik, 204. Amuna, Aleph, Mem, Vav, Nun, Hey, equals in the world of Gematria 102. To be a Tzadik, to be a truly righteous individual, as the Ben Yoda points out, you have to have Beis Amuno. Amuno is 102. Amuno Baseich, Amuno Bachosh, and according to what we're describing, Amuno Balev, Amuno Bapay. You got to speak it out. You have to convey it. When you have Beis Amuno, you live with those two Amunos. Amuno plus Amuno is 102, 102, and that equals 204 Gematria Tzadik. Mosik Midvash. You got to speak things out. So perhaps. Now we understand the monumental role of tefillah in our lives. It's very nice that we believe in God. So God demands tefillah. Tefillah is so yisodi, is so fundamental. It's so fundamental that 
Awen Rav Elosur Tzodek Turchin, who was learning in Cherven, he used to go visit the Chazanish very often. And one time he asked the Chazanish, he got into engaged in an amuna in a belief in God discussion. And the Chazanish said to this Rav Turchin, do you know that when we get to the world above, God's going to say, did you really believe? And you're going to say, of course I believe. What do you mean? Of course I believed in God. And I had a moon of Hashem. And God's going to show us that we didn't fully believe. So he came back to the Chazanish and he said, what did the Rebbe mean? I thought people believe and you work on the moon and you believe it intellectually and you try your best to believe it and incorporate it into your lifestyle. He says, what, do, what was the Chazanish, what was his intent? What does he want us to work on? And the Chazanish replied that you know what Hashem wants us to work on? He wants us to have a relationship with the Almighty above. And the way we have a relationship is as Shim Shem Pinkus points out on page 102 of his Sharm at Tfilah. Tfilah is Lashen, Pilul, a Lashen terminology of his Shabras, like Naftali, Rashi and Vayetze. Naftali, look at Naftali, is Dveikus, is his Shabras. Tfilah conveys, connotes the sense of connection. Explains as Shim Shem Pinkus through Tfilah, we're connected with the Almighty. And it's the Chazanish, we're connected through tefillah. But God says it's not enough three times a day. It's not enough to have the established prayers of a shachris, of a mincha, of a mairiv. To have a real relationship, that means you got to talk to God all day long. That means you have to always be talking to Hashem. Explains the chosenish, whatever you want in life. You get up in the morning, I want it to be a nice geschmack, a San Diego 75 degree, no cloud in the sky type of day. I want to have a geschmack, a tasting cappuccino. I want it to be comfortable. I want to have green lights. I want to get to work. I want to make money today. I want to get an A on the test. I want to have good shalom, bias, harmony, and peace in the home. I want my children to be well. I want to have health. I want to have happiness. I want to have nachas. Kalayas. So whatever you want in life, explain the chazanish. To have a truly meaningful relationship with the Almighty. It's not enough to say, I believe in the Almighty. You got to make it real. You got to make it genuine. You got to make it authentic. And how do you do that? You got to talk to Him. That's not enough to talk to Him just three times a day. Sprinkle periodically throughout the day. Okay, you give Him a chakras, a minchamai. And in the Chazanish, talk to him the same way you love your wife. She wants to hear, I love you a million times over. You could have told her a million times before. You still have to say the other. What do you mean? But she knows you love her. Tell it to her anyway, because it makes it real. It reinforces it. It's machasik, and it strengthens the message. You really love God, you want a connection with God? Hashem gave us a gift of tefillah. And what is tefillah? Heschab, is tefillah, is connect Hashem. Klai, so we just had Pesach, you believe. And now God's testing us. And we're in these moving, these trying, these challenging times, surrounded by a corona pandemic. And people say, I don't have my shul, and I can't connect to my rav every single day, and I don't have my base Knesset, my base rubbish. And I can't go out to work necessarily, I can't do what I used usually do. I want to connect to God. How do I do it? The number one conduit, the number one intermediary is what? Tefillah. Tefillah itself bespeaks this lofty ideal of connection of Tevekas, of Eschabras, connect to God. But in one way, as the Chazanish would tell us, speak to God. Speak to Him. Get up in the morning. God, I want it to be a great day. I want to feel good. I want to believe you. I want to live with you. I want to eat every time you eat. I want to talk to God before, a blessing before, a blessing after. Everything's got to be a Tefillah. When you get up in the morning until you go to sleep at night. You want your car to be comfortable. You want everything to work. You want everything to stim. You want everything to be a great, glorious day. No matter what's going on outside, no matter how crazy and chaotic the inside of the home might get, but always talk to God. Always communicate. Always talk. If you talk to the Rebona Shalom and you connect, then you'll make your Amun of Hashem far more real. So never stop davening. Never stop talking to the Almighty. As Onosa Meir Vachvel go writes in Lekarashimus, you will change yourself in the process. The connection is all about you become a different person. If you love Hashem, you Baruch, and I know you all do. And yes, even through thick and thin, and God is testing us. And these are trying, difficult times, and sometimes painful, painful times. And the end of the day, never lose, don't sever that tie. Talk to Hashem, and if you don't think it's Phyllis are getting answered, but just know He's listening through thick and thin every second of the day. Never cease talking to Him and asking for everything. And when you get certain answers, never stop thanking Him. Keep that relationship alive and well. And what's the key to doing that? Explain the Chazanet. Never stop talking to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Live with Him, not only in your heart, in your speech. 
tefillah, communicate a connection through Koach Hadibur, never stop telling Hashem, I love you, I love you, I love you, I believe in you, I believe in you, and you'll reinforce it, and you will get those messages, keep your eyes and ears wide open, and you will sense every single day of your lives, God is sending those messages right back, He's reciprocating accordingly, and He's telling you, just open the heart, open your soul, and you'll see that God is telling you every second of the day, my dear Yiddish child, my dear Jew, I love you, I love you, I love you, I care about you. And if I brought you to it, I'm going to carry you through it. So we're going through difficult times. But as Dr. Fox will tell you, we're going to grow through difficult times. Never stop the growth process. Never stop speaking. Never stop davening. Never stop that one-on-one relationship with the Almighty above. Never stop davening. Never stop asking. Never stop thinking. Never stop loving. And know that He loves each and every one of you more than you could ever imagine. Baruch HaNatzlocha. And let's have an end to all these tzaras. And let's dance together hand in hand as we sing to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Ashira Chadosha with Mashiach Tzedkenu. Mehei Rav Yameinu. Amen family. This is Dr. David Fox, Director of Crisis Intervention, Trauma and Bereavement Services for High Lifeline. And thank you for tuning in on this program regarding going through it and growing through it, the Torah perspectives and mindful coping in the age of COVID-19. It is, of course, an honor to partner with Rabbi Feiner Schlita, whose address was one of inspiration and chizuk, and also some very practical guidelines coping spiritually during this time. My focus tonight will be on some of the psychological realities and also the psychological and spiritual considerations which we can draw on in growing through the realities and challenges of this trying time in our lives. First, let's acknowledge to ourselves that this is a challenging time. This is a tekufa of real nisyonos and yisurim. People are frightened, and they have grounds to be frightened. People are sad, and for many that's an understatement. For whereas a trauma is a situation that overwhelms us, for which we have no personal history or reference point with which which to make it understandable, this is really a catastrophic trauma because in addition to the overwhelming component and the fact that virtually none of us has a reference point in our memories, in our lifetimes, our histories, that guides us in how to respond internally and behaviorally. This is catastrophic because it's constant. And there are tragic losses. And they keep happening. And it's catastrophic because we're dealing with unknowns. And there is rampant uncertainty among so many of us and not knowing where this is headed and how to begin planning or navigating a pathway through it. So let's be open to the reality and accepting that in our children and also in ourselves, there are imprints. This makes a Roshim. This does affect our thinking our ability to focus and concentrate. This affects our emotions, whether we're sad or anxious, whether we're worried or frightened, whether we're irritable or frustrated or all or more emotions like that. And this affects our behavior and this affects our sense of physical safety and well-being. And some of us 
are hurting physically, even unrelated to being ill or not ill. And this also conjures up for all of us a spiritual challenge. What do we do? How do we frame this? Can we make sense of it? Can we find purpose in this catastrophic trauma, which has become part of our lives? Our realities have changed. What was once familiar is not necessarily dependable anymore. Our assumptive realities, the things we've taken for granted all of our lives, we can't necessarily take for granted anymore. So people are suffering and we are suffering and a thinking mindful person is also yearning for a way to get through it. And Bez Hashem, we will get through it. And let's take a look together tonight at some steps that we can consider. One of the great difficulties of emotional reactions, psychological upheaval, when we're facing actual crisis and objective stresses, is that we begin to think that perhaps there's something wrong with us, perhaps there's some flaw, some deficiency in us. And it's so vital that we accept that for the most part, most of us who might react in our thoughts, in our moods, in our mood energy, in our feelings, most of us are having normal reactions. And these are normal reactions to circumstances which are hardly normal. But yet, given that the external stresses, the changes in our lives, the environmental pressures are very abnormal. They're not part of our assumptive reality. So let's understand that the mind, the heart, the spirit reacts to these intense changes, these upheavals, these collisions of so many things that we've become accustomed to and relied upon. And when that happens, we do develop symptoms of distress that's commensurate for, with the object of stress that we're trying to deal with. So let's understand that we want to look at ourselves with openness and with honesty. We want to listen to one another, spouse to spouse, friend to friend, and certainly parent to child, and to inventory openly how we're handling this. And when someone discloses to you that they're scared, validate that. Don't try to talk them out of it. Even the thought of trying to make it go away, which is so much a part of being a caring person, being a yid, that we want to help a person's distress disappear. But at a time like this, if a person's able to give words and find a voice to talk about their distress, so we want to listen receptively, not critically, not judgmentally, and to validate that what you're going through, you're going through because this is a frightening time, or this is a sad time. And yes, you're worried because there are many, many fears in our lives right now. So we listen receptively, just like we would want the person we turn to and unloaded to, to give us room to express what we're going through. And we want them not to shut us down, either critically or in trying to cheer us up and divert our feelings into something that's not right now real for us. So let's be receptive, let's be attentive, and for ourselves, let's be mindful, let's do that self-scan. Let's take some time away from the noise and away from the pressures, and when we can make that niche for ourselves where we have some welcome solitude, as opposed to the agony of being lonely, but let's take that time for self-preserving, self-care solitude, and do a self-scan, which means do some breathing, 
allow yourself to be composed, not distracted by things around you, tuning out the noises, and listen to your body, and listen to your thoughts, and allow your emotions to register, and pick up anything that you're doing physically, your ticks, your twitches, your itching, and even examine your very soul, that area inside of yourself which is subjective and personal and private. But explore it. Do that self-scan of all those five dimensions, the cognitive, the affective, the somatic, the behavioral, and the spiritual. And be mindful in the present, what's going on inside of me. Pick up on it. Be attentive to it non-critically because your thoughts are your thoughts and your feelings are your feelings. And stay focused and relax your breathing and keep the body still and at ease. But check in with yourself and be self-aware. How am I coping? What's going on with me at this time? This is part of self-care. Another essential part of caring for ourselves during high-pressure times, times of trauma, times of catastrophic trauma and crisis. Let's be aware that our lives have changed. So much around us is not familiar anymore. We know that Chazal speak about how she noy veset t'chilas choli, that altering our rhythms, confronting the unfamiliar, encountering major changes leads to upheaval, leads to a dysregulation of how we function and how we feel. So let's be aware of that, and that's very true. But yet there's somewhat of an antidote, a remedy, all of us in our personal lives and as parents with our families do what we can to bring some routine into our lives, whether it's the time we arise, the time we go to sleep, the times that we eat our meals, that we engage in our tefillos and our study and our Torah learning. But make sure that we have a routine. Make sure that we have a schedule which we adhere to. And make sure that we have some structure throughout our day, our afternoon, and our evening. And structure means that in addition to doing all the things I have to do, because that's what normalizes my schedule, in addition to doing all the things that I need for my survival, my sleep, my rest, my exercise, my meals, my hydration, in addition to healthy routine, in addition to healthy schedule, let's have structure, which means this is a time for bonding with family. This is a time for spouses to talk openly with each other about their feelings, about their dreams, about their ideals. Include in the structure of your day and your night some time for constructive activity, maybe beyond the routine, maybe even creative or artistic or musical activity, if that's what speaks to you. Because the part of the brain that's storing so much of the angst, so much of the woe, so much of the agony and the pain, that part of your brain is holding on very, very tightly to distress, which you can dilute by activating those same parts of your brain with some creative activity. And whether you write poetry, or whether you sing songs, or the family does mirrors together, mm-hmm. or whether you engage in artwork, whether you're good at it or not, but doing something that's a diversion that's allowing you to draw on some of your creative energy. This helps free the brain somewhat of that stranglehold it has on you because of the heavy feelings in you. So routine, so schedule, so structure are all so important for getting through. Another thing that's very important is Do what you can, quarantine, make the time with your family purposeful. Talk about things you don't normally talk about, 
not about disease, not about death, not about Parnassa, not about other people, not about politics, not about problems. Those things are going to be discussed at different times anyway. But make time to talk about values, about what makes us a family, what's good about our family, what are some things we want to change and make different in our family so we can all be at ease and we can all be close and we can trust each other. But having values-based discussions, we may not do enough of that during the rest of the year, and this might be a fine time to try doing it when we have the time. And particularly if the values which we can talk about as spouses, as parents with children, have to do with what are our beliefs. How are we dealing with all of this catastrophe at a Ruchnius level? Let's be open because how often do we get a chance to talk about the Spirit? How often do we take time and how often do we make time to talk about what is our be talking about? And how do we actualize it? And what steps can we take as children or as teens or as adults to make that be talking real, something that we rely on because we rely on Kodesh Baruch the only one that we can always depend on. But turn to him and talk to him and talk about him with your kids and talk about Nishama and talk about what it means to have spiritual longings and can you quantify that? Do you always translate that into behavior? Can you learn about it? Where do you learn about it? Who do you talk about it with? But this is a time when the Ruchnius is so important to hold on to. And for those of us who barely hold on to it, then this is the best time in our lives to access it so it can be part of us. And let's also talk about hope. Being hopeful that's not the same as being in denial. That's not the same as just trying to think optimistically. Although I will tell you that optimism and positive thinking is another remedy for some of the damaged circuitry in a brain that's exposed to loss and to trauma. And actually a wonderful exercise to inculcate your children and yourselves with is the expression of gratitude at a time like this and talking about what I'm grateful for and talking about who I want to thank for something or whose example was inspiring to me who I'm grateful for and I have gratitude for and I have thanks for and I was impressed by and talking about the niceness that those around us, including family members, are managing to show for others at this time. The chasadim and the gamilas chasadim, the ahavas reim, the efforts to ease another's anguish. Talk with gratitude and, as I said, train your children to express gratitude because this also will begin to help rewire the brain that's hurting and that's feeling isolated and that's feeling alone and that's feeling so dejected, including that sense of rejection by people who we don't see anymore and don't check in with us because we can't socialize and we're keeping this distance. So talk about gratitude. This is not just a spiritual piece of musr, but this is practical cognitive psychology neurocognitive psychology because you're getting into the brain itself and you're helping revise some of its da damaged wiring that is an unfortunate casualty of living day after day with frightening news and with sad news and with loss Rahman al-Islam. But let's also go back to hope. Let's talk about being hopeful. As I said, it's not going into denial. It's not just being optimistic and giving a positive twist on something. But hopefulness is one of the kochos ha-nefesh. When a yid, when a Jew can 
tap into his or her hope. This is an energy of the soul itself. And Chazal talk about this. The bracha Yaakov gave Sheva Don Lishwascha Kivisi Hashem. The Medrash says, Hakol Bekivui. Everything depends on a hopeful attitude. We get through Yisurim, says the Medrash, Bekivui, by being Mekaveh, by hoping. And we get to the Yeshua, and we get to the Geula, and we achieve Slicha, and we attain Chanina, all of these Midos, Milamala, the catalyst for them is getting ourselves into an attitude of hopefulness. And hopefulness means that we, re, we really project ourselves a little bit into the future. And we think about the times that will come. And we trust that they will be better times. And so when you're having in your imaginative fantasy wholesome images, a hopeful vision of what will happen when we're through this, how will we have grown as we went through this? This is not going to remain just a neurocognitive state, meaning it's not just the brain is going into the abstract, but this is also going to facilitate an emotional state in us because when we're thinking hopefully, we're feeling hope. And when we're feeling hope, we calm down and the breathing and the heart rate begin to settle. And we begin to take on this internal glow. And we look for the positive and we express the positive and the gratitude. So it's a state of mind, it's a state of heart, and it's a state of spirituality. And this is something to practice for ourselves. And this is something to train our children to think about. Because right now, for many of us, not only is there no light at the end of the tunnel, we don't even see a tunnel. But we hope for the tunnel. And we hope for the light because we trust and we have faith. And our bitachon is our bitachon. And our kivui, our hopefulness, actualizes our bitachon from a deep embedded concept into a way of thinking and a way of behaving. So these are tough times. And a lot is unfamiliar to us. And there's a lot we can do to start bringing a sense, at least for the time being, of routine and schedule and structure into our lives. And we can talk to each other and we can look for avenues of being closer and we need to. And that includes the tefillah, as Rav Feiner said, as a means of drawing closer to Kaviyachal and closer to each other. But on the one hand, when it comes to our distress, be mindful. Stay in the present. Don't let your minds run away into the what-ifs. Don't let yourself run into the cynicism. Don't let yourself travel with great velocity into thinking and fearing that this is just going to get worse. Let the news talk about that. But for us, let's instead stay present, focus on what we think, what we feel, what we're going, what we sense, what's happening inside of us now. But when it comes to developing a sense of hopefulness, yes, we can move ahead. We can move past the present in an adaptive way by thinking about a positive present. And the last recommendation I give from my heart for all of us is that we look at ourselves as we're going through this and trying to grow through this and we ask, what is my most important role? My most important role is to be a model for my family and for others of how an adult with Yerushimayim faces Nisoyan. 
how an adult with Yerushamayim deals with challenge and how we cope effectively. Because in the long run, we want our children to look back at this time not by saying, my parents couldn't hold it together, they fell apart. And they screamed and they were angry and they were irritable, they weren't there for us and they talked about the worries and the parnasa in front of us and it scared us more and added to the trauma. We don't want our kids to remember that. We want instead our children to think back about Tati and Mommy were role models. They demonstrated a certain fortitude. They were encouraging to us. They helped us look deeper inside ourselves and they helped us identify ways, tools that we can cope with spiritually, psychologically, and interpersonally. And that's our most important role. And the question we want to leave ourselves with is, for ourselves, when Ezra Sashem Bokorov, when this is over, and we build our new reality, and we look at the world, and we breathe easy, and we're healthy, and we start constructing a more wholesome and a more halig routine for ourselves, will we be able to look back at how we coped, how we got through this, how we grew through this? Will we be able to look back and be made on ourselves that despite the struggles and the hardships, despite the losses and the devastation, that we increased our sense of resilience. We enhanced our style of coping psychologically. And we actually improved and built on our ruchnius and became more spiritual people who talked with HaKadosh Baruch Hu and developed a sense that he's here with us and he's here for us. Koive Hashem Yachlifu Koach, the Navi says. Those of us who place our faith and our hope in the Kaviyahu, Yachlifu Koach, they'll regain their strength. They'll build their strength. And may HaKadosh Baruch Hu bring a healthy, rapid close. Umimena Yivasheya. And wishing you all Rafua, Nechama, Yeshuos, and Basoros Tovos.